Yep. Okay. Good evening, writers and honored guests, and welcome to the 2024 Norfolk Literary Prize Award Ceremony. <laughs> On behalf of the Norfolk County Public Library staff and board, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. I am so happy to see so many smiling faces in the audience. My name is Belinda, and I'm the virtual coordinator for the Norfolk County Public Library. <laughs> Jen's making faces at the back there. And I also direct and kind of coordinate the Norfolk Literary Prize writing contest every year. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the many nations who call this land home. We acknowledge the indigenous and non-indigenous brothers and sisters who walk this land in the past and to those who walk it today. This, the traditional treaty lands of the Anishinaabe, Neutral, and Haudenosaunee peoples. I also want to recognize and thank the sponsors of this year's contest. We had a really beautiful community response in support of this writing contest. It's all listed on the back of your program. So we have the Simcoe Lions Club, the Friends of the Library Delhi Branch Chapter, the Friends of the Library Port Dover Branch Chapter, the Lions Club of Port Dover, Caradoc Townsend Mutual Insurance Company, PBS Renovations, the Port Rowan Legion Branch 379, and Dave Variety of Delhi. So thank you very much. It's your generous support that not only provides opportunities such as this, but changes lives within the community. Let's hear it for our sponsors. So we have a really wonderful evening lined up with honored guests and our keynote speaker, author Brooke Marley Jones. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome the Norfolk County Public Library CEO, Julie Kent, to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, community members, families, and most importantly, to all the writers whose words and imaginations have brought us together tonight. It's a true privilege to celebrate with you. I would also like to extend a heartfelt gratitude to our sponsors who have made this evening possible. Thank you for your unwavering support of the arts in North Fork County and for championing the voices of both emerging and experienced writers your commitment to fostering creativity is invaluable and deeply appreciated. And you thought you had a tongue tied moment. <laughs> really? You're making me look Really? Okay. <laughs> well, thanks, Melinda. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm back. <laughs> Tonight, we recognize more than just literary achievement. We celebrate the transformative power of the written word. Each of you who submitted to the Norfolk Literary Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> Help me out. You might just sit down. I was going to say you read it for me. Wow. All right. Has taken a courageous step. You've channeled your thoughts, experiences, and creativity into stories and poems that not only reveal something about yourselves, but also offer all of us new perspectives, new emotions, and new dreams. Congratulations to each and every one of tonight's award recipients and entrants. Writing, as we've seen through these diverse submissions, is a process, a journey. It's about our own truth, depth, and sometimes profound exploration. Mm -hmm. Writing allows us to connect, to heal, to even confront challenges, both speculative and real. This evolution to the Norfolk Literary Prize <laughs> shows how powerful writing can be, how it becomes a voice of expression, growth, and empathy. Creative writing isn't just an activity, it is a journey. For those who write, it's a way to capture fleeting thoughts, to make sense of emotions, and sometimes to find joy in simply getting words on a page. And for those of us who read these works, each story, poem, and essay can be a doorway to a new understanding, a reminder that our individual experiences are part of something larger. Your words have the power to bring readers comfort, insight, and inspiration, and that's no small achievement. Today we celebrate not only the courage and talent of our writers, but also the incredible support of our sponsors. Thank you for believing in the importance of creative expression and for providing the resources to make events like this possible. Your dedication to the arts in Norfolk County helps foster creativity and community, and we are deeply grateful for your commitment. So, to our writers, keep going, keep exploring, 
keep telling your stories and keep sharing your voice. In doing so, you inspire others and create a legacy that will reach far beyond this evening. Thank you and congratulations to all. Thank you so much, Julie. Next, I'd like to invite the Honorable Amy Martin, Mayor of Norfolk County, to share a few words. Thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, before I start my speech that I think Julie stole from me, um, I would just like to say, if you haven't already had the opportunity to check out the library on their social media, they had a phenomenal Halloween video that was so stinking good. So make sure you uh, check that out. You're great job, you're doing a really great job uh, connecting with the community and it was, it was great. Um, thank you all for, for joining. So poetry is when emotion has found its thought and the thought has found words and you may have heard of this uh, poet, famous words, Robert Frost, but it doesn't need to be that complex. Margaret Atwood once said, a word after a word after a word is power. With that, it is with great pride that I officially welcome you all to the 2024 Literary Prize um, event here in St. William, a celebration of the literary talents and achievements from many of you who are unpublished writers right here in Norfolk County. The Pride Literary Prize began in 2005 as the Teens Write for Fun contest. It later evolved into the Write for Fun contest to include a broader age range. And in 2019, it was renamed once again to ex uh, recognize the expressive works that they received. We have three age groups, children, youth, and adults, and two categories, poetry and short stories, for a total of 18 awards. And in, in addition to those awards, we also have uh, Poet Laurette John B. Lee here with us tonight. At the back, there we go. Um, I wish to congratulate each and every one of you and just recognize you for being here, either as a submission or uh, supporting someone who is a writer. And this year, it, the, the submissions uh, came in from 52 writers contributing 100 pieces of work with ages ranging from 9 to 90. This year, we're honored to have author Brooke Marley Jones as our keynote speaker. And um, I would also like to just take this opportunity to thank Norfolk County Public Library, our CEO Julie, our board chair Kim Earls is here, and Belinda for making sure this event continues each and every year. And then a very special thanks to all of the judges who are local freelance writers, uh, editors, published authors, retired educators, journalists, and more. And then lastly, I would like to close out today with a word of advice. Uh, keep writing, as Julie said, keep writing. Whether you win an award or you simply enjoy creating stories, uh, writing is a skill that will serve you for the rest of your life. It keeps your mind sharp, it expands your vocabulary, and it can contribute to making you feel more grateful. Whether you draw inspiration from a modern day influence like Taylor Swift, a tortured poet, or something classical like Emily Dickens' introspective poetry, or maybe something dark from Edgar Allan Poe. Whatever it is, I urge you to continue to write, to share your craft, and make your mark on our community. Thanks for joining, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and sharing your words of encouragement. Next, I'm going to invite the Norfolk County Public Library Board Chairperson, Kimberly Earls, here to share her insight and encouragement. Thank you, good morning. My biggest fear is that following Julie and Mayor Martin that the microphone will be too high. <laughs> so I'm pleasantly surprised that I'm within range. So thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. And uh, I wanna bring greetings on behalf of all the board members uh, who serve on the Norfolk County Library Board. Uh, they are all uh, very passionate supporters of the library and of this event. And this is the second time uh, that I've had the chance to attend this event. And I am so pleased to see some, some familiar faces from last year. So that is so exciting. Um, I'm an avid reader and sometimes writer myself. Um, and as I was preparing for tonight, I kind of asked myself, like, what does propel or motivate people to write? 
Um, because writing really does make you vulnerable. Uh, it takes a certain amount of bravery and um, uh, maybe a little bit of confidence that you have to dig deep uh, to find, to be able to put your thoughts and your ideas uh, forward for someone else to read and enjoy and inadvertently judge. And so as I thought about some of those things, I was thinking about why do we write? So we, we write to share our emotions, to express ideas, to inform or persuade others, uh, to kind of stretch our creative legs in, in developing stories and creativity, sometimes because we have to if it's for school or work. And so um, sometimes that's the spark that gets us going. And maybe it's just to learn a new skill or because we have a deep appreciation of literature and are a writer or a reader and want to pass along that, that joy of the written word to someone else. And so uh, with that, um, I just want to give, um, I guess, a little bit of a plug for the library <laughs> general. So uh, libraries are an important part of our community. They support lifelong learning. They provide resources for budding and experienced writers. And we have a wide range of tools and resources at the Norfolk County Public Library. We're so fortunate we have passionate staff that are always uh, willing and able and ready to help out. Um, and it's a place where you can come and use those tools, be inspired and hopefully encouraged to, uh, if not uh, have submissions to an event like this, but even just for your own personal growth and development. So I really encourage you um, to continue to support and uh, attend and use the resources of the library. And so with that, um, I'll just give one quick quote from one of my favorite writers, C.S. Lewis, you can make anything by writing, which is true. And so with that, I want to thank you all for being here tonight and uh, I look forward to hearing everyone's submissions. Thank you. So now I'm going to invite and introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, Brooke Marley Jones. Brooke writes fairy tales and nightmares filled with tenderness and terror. Her stories take place in wild woods and gothic buildings overgrown by roses and forgotten to the world. In this lifetime, Brooke resides in Niagara with her beautiful husband and two fluffy cats. Please join me in welcoming Brooke to the stage. Uh, thank you. Brooke is going to have a table at the back, so after the ceremony, um, feel free to have a chat, buy a book, get an autograph and a picture, and you like, take it away. Okay, so I suspect there are quite a few authors in this room, and I imagine you can all relate when I say that I am deeply honored to be here giving this speech, but I'm also deeply terrified to be here giving this speech. So be careful not to all blink at once because if you leave me unwatched, I will be screeching as a <laughs> um, So my name is Brooke. Uh, I write under Brooke Marley Jones and I'm here to tell you a little bit about my journey tonight. So I went to Jarvis Public School and my home library was actually the Jarvis Public Library. So I'm actually the Haldeman girl. Uh, but rest assured, when I was growing up in Jarvis, there was literally nothing around. So I had to come to Simcoe and Port Dover if I wanted to do anything. And I even worked at Nestle's for a while. So um, really, this is part of the community. <laughs> that because it's about myself and also now that I'm a very odd adult I realize that's not <laughs> such a bad thing and I mean I'm up here so um, regardless of oddities the library is indiscriminate the library exists for everyone and as a child I devoured books about Egypt and mineral minerals and the Middle Ages and it wasn't long until I dove into fiction and horror you know, books that, while I could read them, I really probably shouldn't have been reading them. <laughs> and being a voracious reader, my favorite programs at the library were always those summer reading programs where you got ballots for prizes based on pages read. 
and those other 10-year-olds didn't stand a chance. <laughs> <laughs> They'd come in and they'd get a ballot or two and I'd slam a stack of Stephen King's in that return and leave the baby to go sign the sign. And it got to the point where I'd have to give um, an oral report as well as a written report to prove that I'd read them. And um, I, I had, at the time, I never really understood the librarian's looks of utter mortification as I excitedly told them exactly what Carrie did to all those kids. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you all know of my childhood love for reading and keeping in mind that I'm a published author, can anyone guess the only class I nearly failed in high school? It was English. Grade nine English, 14 years old, nearly failed straight away. Uh, I bring a sort of, I know the rules, but I like to break them vibe to the function that doesn't always work in my favor. And I struggle with the rigidity of English. Uh, I tend to see different perspectives and I question why things are the way they are rather than just accepting what I'm told. So English was really difficult for me. Um, luckily though, in my later years of high school, I had an English teacher that was more receptive to my way of thinking. And she was the one that made me realize like, hey, maybe I'm not half bad at this writing thing. Dare I say good even? Uh, and people around me seemed to know. It seemed like everyone else knew I had a knack for writing, but I just, I didn't believe it. And despite my doubts, I enrolled in some English courses at Brock University. Can anyone guess the only class I ever nearly failed at university? <laughs> <laughs> Again, it was English. I barely made it out alive. And you all must be thinking, wow, for an inspirational speech, she sure is hinting at failure an awful lot. <laughs> we in the biz call that foreshadowing. <laughs> And even in the university, people were still asking me, you know, why don't you write a book? You're so creative and you've got such a way with words. So I was thinking, why would I try and write a book? You know, I love writing, but I'm terrible at it. I can't write an essay to save my life. So all my scribblings remained hidden in notebooks. And once I graduated and after a several year stint working as the publishing assistant for an international magazine, I naturally fell into a position with the public library. For me, libraries were home and part of that was the books and part of that was the people tending the books. Um, if you ever need help or a kind word, find someone who works in a library. Eventually I moved from public libraries to academic libraries and I was happy for a little while. Uh, again, my coworkers were incredible. I had a nice office, a good paycheck, and I got to order books all day. But there was something tugging at me. Uh, I felt like I was ignoring the thing that I was made for, the thing that made me really special. And my husband knew writing made me happy. It was the only thing I could lose myself to for hours. And it was him who planted the seed of taking writing more seriously, but I was scared. What if I found out I wasn't good? What if people didn't like what I wrote? What if I failed? What would if I just sat down and wrote? So I did. Every day before work, I woke up early to write. In the evenings, I'd continue writing, and on the weekends, I did exactly what I wanted to do. I got out my pen, and I wrote some more. It took me about a year and a half, but I did it. I finished my book. I left my library job so I could focus on getting that book published. I remember thinking, I was so relieved. I mean, the hardest part was over, right? Right? <laughs> now, a lot of people don't know about the gauntlet that is the publishing process. And I mean, I didn't know until I had to do it myself. But the main thing you need to know is that authors can't approach a publisher. You need an agent first. Well, that's just one thing. Get an agent. That can't be so hard, right? Right? <laughs> Turns out the odds of getting an agent are like 1 in 1,000. That's a 0.1% chance. Now, that statistic might have scared some people away, but I am notoriously bad at math. <laughs> and I had to use a calculator on that percentage, and my brother and husband still pointed out that I was wrong the first time. <laughs> And applying to an agent is a lot like applying for a job. You need to write a letter, provide summaries, explain why you're a good fit, give your prints and a sample of your DNA. No, not really. I mean, not really. <laughs> but it's a pretty intensive and time-consuming process. In my first round, I applied to 30 agents. No bites. Well, bar one who requested my manuscript on the first day, that's good. 
but didn't respond until a month ago. So that <laughs> it's fine. I hear 700 days between emails is actually pretty fast in the publishing industry. <laughs> My first round of applications didn't get me anywhere. I felt quite stressful, but I, I wasn't ready to give up. I worked with a developmental editor. I rewrote my book once, twice, thrice. I lost count of revisions. And then I tried reapplying to agents again. 70 more of them to be exact. It was hours of work. It took years, not days, years. And what did I have to show for it? 100 rejections. No one wanted to work with me. No one wanted my book. This was that disastrous failure I was so worried about. Right about then, giving up was pretty tempting. It takes a lot to put yourself out there every day and face rejection over and over and over again. But I knew in my heart I had something special. So I decided to pivot to find another way because there is always another way. And that's the thing about authors. We're artists. We think outside the box. We don't stay on a path just because we're told to. We trod through the weeds, we detour, we'll fly if we have to, but art, passion doesn't stop. Art exists in spite of rejection. Sure, those other paths might be harder, but we work harder. And I kept going. Because it wasn't going to be an agent getting my story out there or a publishing agency, it was me. They weren't going to stop me because I wasn't going to let them. I perfected my story, I begged all my friends to give me feedback, I took edit editing courses, I realized my own inadequacy as an editor and hired a professional editor, I worked with a formatter, formatter. I found an illustrator, all of which are steps that came with their own setbacks, but I'm trying to keep it brief. I did a lot of Googling, I did even more crying. <laughs> I ignored all the people who said independently published books don't sell, and on June 6, 2024, I published my book myself. My book is available on Amazon. You can order it through Indigo, Barnes and Noble, and all the other big bookstores worldwide. It's also on the shelf of many indie bookstores and many libraries. I did that. Not an agent, not a publisher, I did that. Within three weeks of my book launch, I was approached by an invite-only company who wanted to produce my audiobook. This was the same company that skyrocketed Andy Weir and his novel The Martian to fame. I happily accepted because they offered me a good deal and definitely not because that's my favorite book of all time. <laughs> and here I am, in just a few months, I've sold not hundreds, but thousands of books. Thousands of people have read my story. Since I've released my book, I've done signings and interviews, I've had kindergarten friends see my book in shop windows in England, and I've been asked to do speeches. None of these incredible things would have happened if I didn't keep going. What if I stopped when that English teacher nearly failed me? What if I stopped when that first agent nearly failed me? What if I stopped when the 100th agent rejected me? And this is where, hopefully, my speech turns from failure to inspiration. I want to congratulate the people who win tonight because you worked hard and you're talented and you deserve it. But I would ask that you listen carefully to what I have to say you probably won't always win. One of my favorite fictional characters once said, you can commit no mistakes and still lose. <laughs> you could write the perfect story, some people won't like it, and you have to be okay with that. Let me give you an example. I adore blue cheese. I think blue cheese is absolutely delicious. <laughs> Show of hands, who in the room hates blue cheese? <laughs> Terrible palace. <laughs> Please don't review bomb my book because I said you had shot. <laughs> but the point is, not everyone likes delicious food. <laughs> All our tastes are different, and art is no exception. People won't always like what you do, and I'm here to tell you, you have to continue in spite of that. Because there are people out there who will love your work for exactly the reasons others reject it. And this is my message, not just to the winners, but for anyone in the room who doesn't win tonight, or anyone who has put down their pen or is frightened to tell their story. In earnest, my most treasured piece of advice is that you keep going. There will be a million reasons to quit, and you need to find a million and one reasons to keep going. 
In retrospect, I don't often think of all the agents who rejected me, but I do think about every single reader who's approached me saying that I wrote their favorite book. That wouldn't have happened if I'd stopped, if I let all those rejections fill me. You must keep going. Do it for all the people whose favorite book or poem or short story or anything might not exist without you. And do it for yourself. As an author, there's no richer feeling in this world than holding your book after you refuse to quit. Take it from someone who has failed their way to success. You can do it. You can do anything you want if you just keep going. <laughs> Like I said, Brooke will have a table at the back with copies of her book to book to purchase. It might just be your next favorite book. <sighs> I just feel like I need to pause for a second. That was so good. <laughs> but we have to proceed because I know there's a lot of eager people in the audience who want to know the outcome of tonight's uh, of tonight. So we're going to now move into the award portion of the evening, beginning with the laureate award. So the Laureate Award is both chosen and presented by John B. Lee, Poet Laureate of Norfolk County. John B. Lee has a comp an accomplished career as a writer. He has m had more than 70 books published to date and is the editor of seven anthologies. A three-time Poet Laureate, he lives with his wife Kathy in the town of Port Dover, where he works full-time as an author. Please join me in welcoming John B. Lee. <laughs> submitted and to select what I think is the best piece of writing in any given year and uh, yeah please and I purchased a uh, trophy for the uh, <coughs> winning piece of writing and this is the trophy and uh, Jennifer Debbie here tonight I was surprised when uh, I revealed the title of the piece because uh, they're all anonymous. I don't know who has written anything that's submitted. And uh, Jennifer was the, the laureate last year. Um, I read all of the short stories and all of the poetry. And uh, in the past, short stories have won. This year, Jennifer's poem won. And I've been, it's been requested of me that I read it. I think it's a beautiful poem, and I think you will agree when you hear it. Anticipation Ode to Emily Carr by Jennifer Getty. Anticipation is silence full of sound, where light and dark, birth and death chase each other, then suddenly, without warning, everything comes up chattering like mad joy. And the earth, the sky, the moss, the trees, and I are gulping it in. My walk is a waltz with a skip and an intermittent gallop with pause to gulp it all in again. The intense colors after the rain swallowed by beauty. Beauty just because it is void of vanity, effortless, flaunting, without need to be noticed, a perfectly ordered disorder, robust, loud, and voiced, shouting gusts of breathy winds, trimming limbs, strengthening their trunks, swaying their arms with invitation for more, never cowering or turning away, never forsaken, for they come from the bowels of the earth, meant to rise up, and greet whatever the sky has to offer. It's mysterious, this relationship, at times delirious, dizzy, my feet floating above my heart, my heart pointing to the path, to the unseen tabernacle in the clearing. The smell of pines upon the air, 
sinking me into peaceful stupor, absorbing, loosening my skin, the veil of inner and outer worlds thin. The woods sing their lullaby. I fall into a dreamy sleep in that secret place where all is sweet and good and grand, where fallen logs and mossy stumps are refuge. They persuade me to rest among them and their overtopping trees. I dream of nameless something. I've seen striving to create something fierce, convincing something of fervent nature, mystic, majestic, like bright twinkling stars in a blue-black sky. Out of silence come the night sounds, like the rest before a crescendo in a spectacular symphony. Out of the night silence, the great horned owl hoots, echoing back from the gully. She answers her echo with the perfect, I am here. Oh, how the anticipation of nature reflects the push and pull of life, and how breath draws the next breath in recognition of the breath to follow, in recognition of the oneness in all things. Anticipation, a silence full of sound. Expect something of wonder. Let it be sweet and good and grand. Let it be where you stand. Jennifer, congratulations, Jennifer Getty, for her wonderful poem, Anticipation Ode to Emily Carr. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, and congratulations to Jennifer. I will hold on to the award and get in touch with her. Okay. Moving toward the individual award presentation, I want to take a couple of minutes to remind everyone how these winners were selected. So, writers here tonight. I see most of you, I don't see all of you, but you, one, the ones who are here will remember that on the submission guidelines, it was very clear and emphasized, do not put your name anywhere on your submission. And that's because all of the submissions were judged blindly. So as Amy said earlier, our judges were made up of qualified volunteers from around the community, including library staff, local freelance writers, educators, um, editors, published authors, and journalists. Each judge was given an age group, which there were three, and a category, which there were two. And all of the submissions within that were represented by a number. The judges then graded each piece, looking closely at form, technique, content, literary devices, and more. And the entries were then, uh, with the highest scores overall, were selected in sequ sequential order. So technically speaking, our judges don't even know who won tonight. So um, another thing that I just made a note of here, a thing that we included in this year's judging was an opportunity for judges to provide feedback on every submission. So, if the writers here tonight, or watching from home, or re-watching later, uh, want to have the feedback from the judges, please come and talk to me, or email me, or get in touch with me. I work at the library. <laughs> <laughs> so, tonight we are in for a lovely treat, as most of the awards being presented will be by our sponsors. And the way that I hope this is going to work out is that if your name is called and you have won a prize, you will come to the stage here, to collect your prize. Um, each year, we ask that our first prize winners read their piece. If it is a poem, um, read the entire poem. If it is a short story, read a portion of it. Um, if, you, if your name is called and you don't have your submission with you, don't worry, I've got you covered. <laughs> you can thank me later. If you're not comfortable reading, though, that is absolutely fair, and we will see about somebody else reading it, likely myself. So, um, once you have left the stage, there's a fancy little photo opportunity for you to get a photo taken, um, and then you can return to your seat. So, first, I would like to invite Brenda Hamburg of the Port Road Legion to come present the Children's Poetry Award. <laughs> Let's hear it for Brenda. <laughs> Good evening, it's a 
pleasure to be here and bring greetings to all of you from the Port Rhone region. Um, probably most of you have been there at one point or another. Um, uh, one of the things we wanted to let you know is that all of the fundraisers we have, every dollar stays in the community and it enables us to do a lot of children's programming and this event as well. So we were very happy to be able to do that. Um, I would like to first announce the third place Winner, it goes to Elsa Tozer for the poem Walk Forever On. <laughs> Second place goes to Reese McMaster for the poem My Superpower Brain. Aurora, Aurora Tozer for the poem Nature. Nature. Sunrise, sunrise, sunset. Silence, quiet, moment. Power, angry, torment, nature. Soft, gentle, loving. Mothers, fathers, siblings. Cruel, mean, unforgiving. Earth, sturdy, water, rock. Babies in their nest. Birds on their wings. Silent, swooping, soaring, beautiful thing. Broken, bleeding, hunted. Rude, fighting, unfair. Tangled, messy, careless, survival. Nature has earth. Earth has beautiful things. Beautiful things have to survive in nature's cruel grasp. Love in our hearts, pain in our souls. Life, death, agony in an unfair world. Our nature's way of saying, everything is relative. There would be no sadness without happiness, no good without evil. We complement each other. It is how the universe is made with nature. Every single sunrise, sunrise, sunset. Next, I would like to invite Kevin Reimer of Caradoc Townsend Mutual Insurance Company to the stage to present the Children's Short Story Awards. saying this correctly, Bryn Gascoy um, for their short story, What If? Let's hear it for Bryn. <laughs> Second place goes to Aurora Tozer for their short story, Gold Doesn't Always Shine at First Sight. for their short story, <laughs> Good Isn't So Great. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read on behalf of Ilsa. Good Isn't So Great. Sky was falling, falling. Fear seared through her. Help, she shrieked into the choking blackness. Tears ran down her cheeks. I will never see my mother or father again. I don't want to die like this. Sky jerked awake. Sweat ran down the back of her neck, her shirt damp against her skin. <clears throat> Light streamed through her curtains, pooling on the floor. She glanced at her alarm clock. It read seven in the morning. Sky rolled out of her royal bed, and the soft silken sheets came with her. Quickly, she got to her feet, not wanting her maid to see her on the floor. She could hear her parents, the king and queen of, of their half of the middle realm, talking in low voices downstairs. There were footsteps in the hallway outside Skye's room, 
With a few, and a few minutes later, someone came knocking at the door. Come in, Hannah, Guy called. Her maid was in, came in and searched around the closet for some clothes until she found a set that she was satisfied with. It was a long silver dress made of silk and silver high heels to match. Uh, is this good, my lady, she asked. Yes, Guy answered. Hannah helped Guy into her clothes. Then she pulled Guy's hair back into a tight bun at the back of her head and stuck a bobby pin in, bobby pin with a little diamond butterfly on the end into the swirl of her hair. Then Sky made her way downstairs into the royal living room. Her mother was seated on the dainty, soft, and squishy blue silk couch at the far side of the room. Her father stood at the window behind the couch. Sky's mother had her lips pursed, and her father had a grim expression on his face. Mariella, they will come to this place at some point, and when they do, he sighed, you will have to understand that we have no choice but to fight, said Skye's father. I understand, Tristan, and I will fight with Sky cut her off. Don't you think that we should just stop fighting and share the land? She entered the room and sat beside her mother on the couch. Honey, her mother said, said her mother, it's our responsibility to keep the peace. You're not keeping the peace, you're destroying it, she said. You think you're so great, but you're not. Good doesn't always win. What, with what you're doing, you're no better than them. Both sides are fighting for power. You're not fighting for peace. All you want is power, and so do they. What does it matter who rules what land? Because you can each have half of it, and if that's not enough for you, then go find somewhere else to live, she finished. Then she got to her feet and stormed out of the room, up the stairs, and into her private library. When your war comes, I will not fight with you, she shrieked back down the stairs. Okay. So next, I would like to introduce Kim Freeman, former NCPL staff and representative of the Delphi cha branch chapter of the Friends of the Library. She is going to be presenting youth poetry.
So now I would like to invite Pete Barch from PFB Renovations to present the Youth Short Story Award. Strength to Forgive. The sun began to fall below the horizon, expelling hues of bright orange, red, and pink all throughout the sky. I had just fashioned a bow and arrow. I had just fashioned a bow and arrows out of the, for our tribe's hunting trip later this season. My brother, Connie, walked toward me, his shoulders tense with frustration. They're cooking rabbit again. This was not news I wanted to hear. I'm sick of rabbit, and so are you. Why don't we go hunting for deer and have ourselves a nice meal? We're being working, we've been working all summer for it, he suggested. I was reluctant at first, but considered it a fun idea. I went to ask Grandpa if he would take us hunting. Looking up at the sky, he answered, no, now is not a good time. I will go with you later. When I gave the news to Connie, he scolded me for asking incorrectly, and he went to ask our Grandpa himself. Coming back from the other side of the longhouse, Connie told me, he said yes, but we must go once everyone is asleep. Grandpa was very smart and knew all the best times to hunt for deer. Awesome, I, explain, I exclaimed, excited to try out my new bow. One thing though, he said that he what, he said that we had to go with, without him. Really? When Grandpa talked to me, he said, Connie assured me, trust, he trusts us to go by ourselves and surprise the whole tribe. to welcome Rob Gould of the Simcoe Lions Club to the stage to present the Adult Poetry Awards. Okay, I usually uh, tell jokes when I'm on the stage, <laughs> so please bear with me. I get accepted into most everything, so here we go. Um, I'm now for the Simcoe Lions Club. I'm the president, and I would like to present Third place to Jalen Mar Day Marshed for the poem Cocoon. Father. Minutes earlier. Born. It's over. 
Labor is over. It is such a blessing to be through that part, the pushing, the pain, pain of stretching, of tearing, of fear, of finality, of life, feeling helpless next to a loved one in agony. Am I a father? Hours earlier, the worst is the waiting, the anxiety of pain yet to come, only to heighten, trying simultaneously to rush but also be present for the ancient event that has no clock, no fixed target, like a musician before a concert, anxiously obsessing over staying calm, am I a father? Days earlier, supporting, when, where, su supporting where support is possible, knowing I am both at once extremely helpful and useless, excited to finish a race months in the making, naturally fearful for the angelic mother in question, buttress of by faith and spirit, am I a father? Weeks earlier, told in the safety and comfort of an office that our baby is here, but no longer with us. I cannot breathe in that office. The confusion, the anger, the tears in an office, in a world I no longer know, the abrupt nature of nature, the crystal sharp slice of loss, never to be here, still to be born. Am I a father? the person who has always helped me organize the Norfolk Literary Prize writing contest before she moved to work at Western University, no shaming, <laughs> former <laughs> library assistant of the Norfolk County Public Library, Katie McNamara. Please come to Thanks for embarrassing me, Belinda, as always. <laughs> We're like honorary staff member. <laughs> Okay, so third place goes to Sandra Vensky for their short story, How Does Your Garden Grow? <laughs> Second place goes to Matt LeBlanc for their short story, The Diver. My little bit of sweetness that helps it all go down. Drench your days in gentle honeyed voices, chiming, bouncing, wailing strings, and it all tastes much more tolerable. I suppose it's not so much the world that I want to drown out, but the anxious watcher in my skull who lets me know whenever people might be approaching. I really shouldn't stare down at my teeth and pretend they don't exist. Oh, but now they've made eye contact with me and it would be rude not to smile and nod. And if they talk to me, I really should talk back, but not too long. I don't want to linger. The music lulls her to sleep so that I can walk the world without her voice nagging at me. It's funny that I have to fill my ears with noise just to find some quiet. While my watcher is asleep, my mind is free to focus on the little things. Birds chasing one another, the flowers on the bridge that strangely smell like cherries, the warmth of the water lapping my toes at the end of the little wooden dock. I can climb in strange places and not worry about who might be looking or what they might think, because for the moment, I've stolen away to my own slice of the world, and it's mine to play with, to appreciate, and to bask in. 
I danced down the trail rather than walk, and I let the music carry me toward the edge of the pond, where the sun is about to make yet another glorious exit. I planned to nestle myself on some rocks and watch her stain the sky as her light grows dim, but I'm startled by you when I realize you've already taken up residence there. I apologize for interrupting your peace while you assure me that I've done no such thing, inviting me to sit. I'm not so naive as I would seem to be. I did feel a knot begin to gather in my guts as you spoke. It was not naivety that kept me there, but a terrible curiosity pulling at me, and a greedy little piece of me that held tightly to my serenity, that hoped I could still have it. I select a rock and I sit, not too close, and I slip my earbuds back in before realizing you're still talking to me. I give up on the music altogether, indulging in your small talk that grows much less small as the sun sinks. You divulge a great deal about yourself, balancing a couple of rocks away, casting your reel over and over with little luck, and I can feel that knot tightening with the unnerving way that you speak about your young ex-girlfriend, deeming her crazy and praising yourself for staying with her for so long. You ask me where I live, pushing for more specificity than I'm willing to give. I lead you away from the subject and begin some small talk of my own, which is inter intercepted with invitations to walk back to your truck for some weed. You suggest that I could stay to have a fire with you where you'll cook us some fish you've caught. This is not a story where I listen to my gut, excusing myself as I realized the light was leaving me and declining your invitation to walk me home. everyone and congratulations to our winners. Let's hear it for everyone. <laughs>